hvala što ste došli. Multimedijalni institut uz svoje novomedijske i filozofske programe je povremeno ima neke izlete u kvir teme i ovaj put je imam čas predstaviti Juliet kao recimo u recentrinje vrijeme jednu od zanimljivih osoba po tom pitanju koja je bila gošća inače ako ste pratili rad mame kroz recimo deset godina takve teme su rađeće predstavljali Pride ili ne znam Vox ili druge organizacije a kada se govorilo o transim queer tema bilo je uvijek u nekom kontekstu ili novih medija ili nekog vrste političkog angažmana ili estetike i to bi zapravo ovaj put bio i slučaj sa Juliet koja je u stvari koju sam ja imao sreće upoznat zahvaljujući Justin Campaign projektu koja je najpoznatija i možda jedna prva velika kampanja protiv homofobije i transfobije u nogometu, a Juliet je bila jedna od osnivača te kampanje. Onda smo prepoznali druge interese zajedno vezano za umjetnost, vezano za medije i ovdje će predstaviti svoj rad koji se tiče prvenstveno tog novinarskog dijela gdje kao pisac za Guardian je producirala seriju članaka. U Ljubljani smo prije par dana govorili o poziciji trans, queer i feminističkih recimo perspektiva unutar sporta, a sutra u Rijeci ćemo govoriti specifično o diskriminaciji i emancipaciji u nogometu vezano uz Justin kampanju. Eto, ako znate nekog u Rijeci, preporučite sutra na Filozofskom fakultetu u jedan sat imamo ovaj nastavak naših razgovora sa Juliet. Juliet, I didn't say anything specific about your lecture. I just told him how we met and what was the context in Ljubljana and Rijeka. So, if you would like, please. Sure, thanks, Jelko. Uh, I'm going to talk about the um, the process by which I came to write about my own transition and gender reassignment from coming out to surgery for the website of The Guardian newspaper in Britain from 2010 to 2012. Um, this lecture covers a process of a uh, period of about 20 years in my life. Um, but quite quickly, you'll be pleased to hear it's not real time. Um, <laughs> and uh, it doesn't just talk about me, it talks about Britain's kind of media culture, some, something about its feminist culture and how those two things uh, interacted with each other and collided with each other and how I saw transgender people represented in, in the media. Um, during that period. So yeah, uh, the talk starts in 1992 in my hometown in England. Uh, it's a small town uh, halfway between London and Brighton on the coast. It's called Hawley and I don't expect any of you to have heard of it because nobody in England's heard of it. <laughs> uh, it's got a population of about 20,000. Uh, it's near an airport and um, the local council is called Rygate and Banstead and Rygate is probably the safest conservative seat in the whole of the United Kingdom. Uh, whenever I want to tell people about Rygate, I tell them that if all of Europe became communist, Rygate would be the last place to go, you know? Um, it's that kind of town. So that's where I grew up. And summer 1992, I'm 10 years old. And I'm at home and I'm watching television and I'm watching uh, the chart show. So, so it's pop music. And number one in the charts at the time is the uh, synth-pop duo Erasure. And they have made uh, four ABBA covers. And the video for, for the, one of the ABBA covers, Take a Chance on Me, has the two men from Erasure dressed as Agnetha and Frida from ABBA. 
Um, and this was my kind of moment of my gender awakening. Years later, I tried to tell people it was somebody really cool from the Andy Warhol movies or something, but it wasn't. It was it was Erasure doing ABBA covers. So I watched these these guys in this video uh, dressed in kind of hot pants and, you know, tight lycra clothes. And I thought, I want to try that. So my parents had gone out. They they'd left me in the house on my own. Uh, they told me not to do anything they wouldn't do. Um, and my mum never liked wearing dresses. So I did something she wouldn't do. Uh, I, I went to the, the spare room in our house and I tried on the nearest thing we had to the other video, which was this kind of electric blue dress that my mum had. And this just felt like the right thing for me to do. It was a really, I've never been able to put this feeling into words, which is a problem because I'm having to write about it at the moment. But there was this sudden, very powerful kind of shock. Um, there was a sexual element to it, but I was 10, so there was a sexual element to most things at that point. Um, but there was something deeper as well, something uh, very fundamental that this had awakened in me. And I thought back a bit. I remembered being at school and being seven years old and playing on my own at school and uh, a boy called Terry from the year above coming up to me and saying to me, look, we have to make you more masculine. And me thinking that was a really weird thing for him to say. I thought, what, who is we? Uh, why do you need to do this? What's, what's the point? I'm, I'm fine. Please leave me alone. And um, that was the first time I really thought about my kind of gender role and how it uh, appeared to people around me. Uh, and then this moment of wearing this dress was the first time that I thought, okay, there is something in me that doesn't fit being male and somehow wearing this item of clothing has triggered this in me, has made me aware of this. And so the first thing I did was carry on wearing my mum's clothes whenever she was out and my parents would go out and I would be very sure to know exactly where they were going and when I thought they'd be back so I could plan everything. And uh, this went on for a while. Uh, and I was terrified of getting caught. Uh, my parents read a newspaper called the Daily Mail. I don't know if any of you here know it. It's um, Britain's most conservative newspaper. It was founded in the 1890s. And the founder of the Daily Mail actually said, my prejudices are the prejudices of the common man. So they're the ones I put in my newspaper. And nothing's changed. It basically exists to just spread the worst conservative values and make everybody hate everybody else. So I would I would get this newspaper and I would look through it and every now and again there would be articles about transsexual people or cross dressers. And the cross dressers were always presented as these sort of very strange people motivated by sex and they would dress up in their wives' kind of underwear when they were out. Uh, they'd be high flying lawyers or politicians, they'd be powerful people, um, and that was how they were presented. And it was always male to female. The transsexual people were always presented as kind of looking ridiculous, um, of being very lonely and sad, and having this choice between realizing themselves as women or giving up their, their good jobs and their family and their nice house in the suburbs in a place like Hawley or Reigate. And um, so these were the kind of stereotypes of, of trans people, of trans women that I uh, took in from, from a very early age, a very vulnerable age. It was very important to me at this age how these subjects were represented. So, you know, the newspapers were out. So I, I looked to television instead, and I, I had a television in my bedroom. I was very lucky. Uh, and I would look through the, the listings late at night to see what I could find that dealt with transgender subjects. And there was a range of things. Um, we had satellite television, so we got chat shows like Jerry Springer and Ricky Lake. Uh, and Ricky Lake would have um, cross-dressers and trans women on and pretty much always give them some amazing transformative makeover that made them feel like a million dollars. Jerry Springer took quite a different approach. It was always very much kind of surprise, I'm transsexual, and they'd get a couple on usually a man and a trans woman, and the man would be told that his partner was trans during the course of the show. And then, you know, who knows what could happen? It was, you know, entertaining, right? Um, so there would be this kind of conflict, and it was usually framed as being the trans woman's fault for not being honest about her gender. Um, I saw this in movies as well. Uh, the Crying Game was a big film in the UK in 1992, and this had this famous twist, and 
it was just before the internet came in, so the filmmakers felt that they could um, they could keep the twist secret. I've just realised I'm doing a talk in a room full of people who are very interested in digital technology. So I'll say it was just before the World Wide Web came in. Um, there are a few laughs. Uh, good. Um, and uh, so the filmmakers still felt that they could keep the twist secret. And um, I'm going to ruin the film for you now by telling you that the twist is that Dill, the leading lady in the film, um, is is trans. Uh, non, you know, she's uh, she still has male genitalia. And there's a a very uh, moving scene where she takes off her clothes and the man she's seeing, Fergus, sees her body and uh, is sick. He vomits. Uh, and this is this is a trope in mid '90s cinema. Uh, if any of you have seen the Jim Carrey film Ace Ventura: Pet Detective, which is a kind of gross-out comedy, uh, a lot of the plot revolves around um, Jim Carrey's character realizing that the woman in an investigation he's doing uh, used to live as a man, and he realizes this and he's kissed her and been intimate with her so he's sick and he vomits and he burns everything all of his clothes and then has a shower and he burns the clothes very next to a shower curtain which looks really flammable so transphobia is dangerous to everybody not just trans people um and he goes to find uh, lois the woman and he basically strips her in front of a room full of men all of whom are sick and are sick when they see her body uh and you're supposed to laugh at that so i was kind of used to seeing trans people portrayed either as these kind of ridiculous weirdos uh these very lonely sad people um or they were deceptive and they were deceiving kind of straight people um or they were these kind of pathetic victims um or occasionally even the psychopaths this had kind of more or less died out by the early 90s um but in films like psycho and dress to kill and then of course the last major one in 1991 silence of the lambs which i didn't see at the time but that stereotype still existed as well so i hope this kind of you know makes sense of a kind of overview of of how I saw myself in the media. And it was always, the focus was always on trans women. The idea of um, female to male people and trans men didn't really figure an awful lot in the kind of public discourse. I didn't see much of that at all. Um, so this is the kind of framework which I have to try and understand myself in. Um, I get to be about 14, 15 years old and I start seeing a few more positive uh, narratives. And these are all in feature films, actually. They're kind of um, largely independent films from America or Australia. Uh, but I start seeing, seeing a few more positive role models. I see Nigel Finch's film about Stonewall from the mid-90s, which, unlike the British organisation Stonewall, which is a political organisation very much for lesbian, gay, bisexual and not trans people, uh, this film of Stonewall gives you some idea of the trans people, particularly the trans people of colour, who were really active in the Stonewall riots of 1969, which are credited with founding the um, LGBT rights movement. So I see that. And I see Priscilla, Queen of the Desert um, from 1994, and it has um, Terence Stamp, Hugo Weaving and Guy Pearce in the film as a transsexual woman, um, a cross-dresser and a drag queen who go across Australia in an old bus to do their old cabaret act. And uh, whilst nobody in the film um, is played by a trans person, the film nonetheless you know, tries to be sympathetic and give some idea of the challenges of trans living much more than what I'd seen in the Daily Mail or anywhere else. Um, challenges of working out your sexuality, of dealing with violence, of existing within a kind of queer context in the immediate aftermath of AIDS. Uh, all of these things are kind of in this film, and um, I found the film really touching. And another thing I liked about that film was that when I was at school, I didn't tell anyone at school about my um, dressing because they beat me up, right? Uh, there was a wonderful comedian in the mid-90s called Eddie Izzard, who was a cross-dresser. Mm. And he talks about um, being at school and not telling anyone at school that he cross-dressed because he thought they'd kill him with sticks, is the phrase he used. Um, and he also was breaking through these stereotypes of transvestites and cross-dressers. He 
talks about a case in America where um, I think it was a a serial killer who collected women's shoes or something. I can't remember it exactly, but you can find the clip on YouTube. Mm. And when the press reported on it, they said, oh, this guy was a transvestite. That's why he was so weird. And Eliazard says, no, that was a fucking weirdo transvestite. I'm an executive transvestite. And, you know, I... I work and I create things and I'm also a transvestite. And I really liked the idea. Uh, obviously, he is very much uh, in jest, but I really liked this idea of building a number of difficult kind of possibilities of role models for people beyond um, beyond what was given to us by the mainstream media. Uh, what Eddie Izzard in particular also showed me is that actually as a, a gender... Um, gender variant person as a trans person it was possible to kind of create my own space within mainstream media and it might be helpful if people did that more to challenge the stereotypes um so i would talk about eddie Izzard at school and i would talk about priscilla queen of the desert and i remember somebody in my maths class one of the kind of cool kids uh asking if anybody had seen this film and saying how much she liked it and i didn't even need to really put my hand up and say yes i've seen it it meant a lot to me because just hearing somebody say that she'd seen this film and that she'd liked it made me feel an awful lot better it made me feel that a much more positive conversation about these issues could be had than the ones i'd heard people having uh, when I played sports or when I hung out with groups of guys uh, that were very much led by the sort of newspapers and the television programs that I've talked about. So that was the situation um, when I left school. And I left school aged 16 in 1998, uh, just after the Israeli trans women Dana International won uh, the Eurovision Song Contest. Now, you know, I have no interest in the Eurovision Song Contest, really. Um, I think I've only ever liked one Eurovision song, which is a a Belgian synth-pop band called Telex, who entered for a joke and tried to come last. Um, They didn't. Uh, But but Dana International won Eurovision, and... um, you know, she was she was out as transsexual, and the terms on which she had to be out as transsexual were very much this kind of hyper beautiful, very feminine uh, gender presentation. But nonetheless, I thought she was a really good thing, and people at my school would talk about her in a, a sort of a positive way under the terms with which they interacted with each other. You know, the guys in my class would basically say, "Yeah, I think she's fit. I would have sex with her," which. That's acceptance, right? In a in a kind of boys part of a, a school, uh, that's an incredibly problematic uh, and difficult acceptance. But um, I kind of instinctively knew at the age of sixteen that that was as good as it was going to get in that kind of context. Uh, luckily, I left that school that summer, and I went to a different uh, school for sixteen to eighteen year olds in another town. And at that point, I started coming out to people. And I came out as gay because I thought that was what I was, you know, as a man who was attracted to men. Uh, And I wanted to come out as something to do with my gender. But I didn't really have a very good vocabulary. Um, Transvestite felt too sexual. Um, I didn't really like the connotations of it, as I've explained. And um, I didn't think it explained me very well. Uh, I had cross-dresser. That made it sound like a hobby, you know, it's like playing the banjo or something. Um, And I had transsexual, but I didn't really realize that was what I was. At the time, I I wasn't certain that I would transition. And at that point, I thought I was happy being in a male body and expressing something to do with my gender identity uh, through my clothing, through the name I used, um, and through the the way I looked. And this would be a kind of two-way process. So I came out as cross-dresser because it just gave me more room to to wear the clothes I wanted to and work out how I felt about myself. Um, And on the whole, my friends were, you know, very alternative people. Uh, You know, a lot of them like kind of Navara. Uh, Not Navara, that's a political radio program now that you should all listen to. Nirvana, which is the band, of course. Um, And bands like Placebo, who are quite androgynous, David Bowie, um... So there was this kind of musical context to this kind of gender play that made it much more easy to come out to to my friends. And I was in a punk band at the time with a friend who was very androgynous. Um, 
And lots of my friends were happy to kind of give me clothes, help me with makeup, talk to me about this. And it all suddenly got a bit easier. Um, and so that was the state of play for two years in my life, really. Uh, I didn't really think so much about how this was portrayed in the media because I was happy finally after six years or so living it for myself. And I didn't really feel this need to, uh, well, mediate it. Then I went to university in Manchester in 2000. I was 18 years old. And I got put in a halls of residence with all guys. Uh, and I liked these guys a lot, actually. They were nice guys, but they were very macho. They were quite boisterous. Most of them were straight. One of them wasn't, but most of them were. And I didn't really feel so comfortable there exploring my, my gender through the way I dressed. I wore a lot of makeup, but that was really about it. And so I went back to the media and... Um, I started to watch uh, a lot more European films and I found people who dealt with gender in a different way. Uh, I became a big fan of Pedro Almodovar, um, who would actually cast trans people in his films, not always as trans characters either. Uh, sometimes there'd be trans actors playing uh, cisgender um, characters, that is non-trans characters, crudely. Um, and cisgender actors playing trans characters. I think that's the case in Law of Desire, which is well worth seeing if you haven't. Um, and Rainer Werner Fassbinder would deal with kind of trans subjects with a trans character at their centre. Um, Derek Jarman's film Jubilee featured Jane County, the transsexual punk singer. And so I started to, to find the kind of culture that really spoke to me that dealt with trans issues. At the same time, I was spending pretty much all of my student loan on uh, old records um, as well as films. Um, I now owe the government about £10,000 for post-punk records and Rainer Werner Fassbinder films. Uh, I'm not quite sure how I'm going to get that back because talking about these things hasn't proved that profitable. But um, <laughs> So I spent all my money on, on this stuff and... Um, one of the albums I bought was by a, a post-punk band from Leeds called The Mekons, and I really liked The Mekons a lot. Um, they sung about um, money and relationships and mining disasters, and they're very left-wing. And one of the records I bought came with a, a big reading list. And one of the books referenced on this reading list was... Uh, was called uh, The Transsexual Empire, The Making of the Modern She-Male, and it was by a writer called Janice Raymond, and it was published in 1979 by the Women's Press. And I thought, okay, this is interesting. The Transsexual Empire, I want an empire. Uh, maybe this can help me. And um, it didn't help me very much, actually. Uh, I bought the book, and it very quickly became clear that this was a kind of, uh, it called itself Radical Feminist Critique, of transsexualism and um, the argument was that um, transsexual people kind of uh, reiterated and reinforced negative stereotypes of womanhood and they were a kind of parody of femininity um, Raymond felt that this was done in collusion with the gender identity clinics and at its most paranoid this text sort of um, comes pretty close if my out outright argues that transsexual people, transsexual women, are part of a plot to kind of undermine and bring down the radical feminist movement. It's a lot of trouble, right? Um, it was inspired specifically by the employment of a trans woman called Sandy Stone at an all-woman record collective called Olivia Records. And um, the people at Olivia Records had asked if it would be okay to have Sandy Stone working for them, which is a discussion you can understand in the historical context. Um, transsexual people had been visible in the media really since just after the Second World War when the trans woman Christine Jorgensen came out in 1952 and there's a, a slow but steady stream of trans people coming out uh, writing autobiographies which was the main way of telling their stories on their own terms and coming out through the mainstream press and it's only really in the kind of 70s that you get in America the emergence of transsexual people not as isolated individuals but as a kind of group of people as a kind of category so in that context where people are setting up all women spaces and collectives you can understand why this might become a discussion um 
what the sad thing is really is the extent to which the most hostile voices kind of won that argument and and were the loudest. Uh, and Janice Raymond was probably the loudest of them all. Uh, I'm going to read to you um, uh, a few sentences from from Janice Raymond, um, and she says, "Rape, of course, is a masculist violation of bodily integrity." All transsexuals rape women's bodies by reducing the female form to an artifact, appropriating this body for themselves. However, the transsexually constructed lesbian feminist violates women's sexuality and spirit as well. Rape, although it is usually done by force, can also be accomplished by deception. It is significant that in the case of the transsexually constructed lesbian feminist, Often he is able to gain entrance and a dominant position in women's spaces because the women involved do not know he is a transsexual and he does not happen to mention it. So that's one of the key passages from, from Janice Raymond. Um, there are all sorts of contradictions in this argument. She seems to suggest at the same time uh, transsexual women are trying to infiltrate the lesbian feminist movement, which suggests some level of understanding of those politics, some desire to be a part of it, but also that there are these kind of utterly apolitical kind of Stepford Wife characters who have no agency or desire or uh, political knowledge of their own, um, which, of course, are mutually contradictory positions. It's a kind of double bind. Um, and there's another kind of double double bind or contradiction in the um, in the theory, which is this kind of idea that was prevalent in the uh, 70s. This idea of biology is not destiny, um, and if you were born female, um, you know that does not push you into any sort of uh, particular social standing or obligation. Um, but when it comes to transsexual people, for Raven, clearly biology is destiny. You're born male, you stay male, that's it. So that doesn't quite stack up either. Um, I didn't read too much of Raymond. Uh, it just upset me, really. Um, and I kind of focused my attention elsewhere. I was still dealing with my own gender on a very personal level. I was actually wearing women's clothing a lot more around Manchester. But in spaces I'd have to create myself, you know, the gay and lesbian society as it was then still didn't feel like a particularly welcoming environment for me as a, as a young trans person. Uh, and I, I tended to um, actually explore these things in a musical context. I ran a record label with some friends and I DJed at our club nights and I would just dress how I wanted there. And because it was my night, if anyone didn't like it, we could just tell them to leave, right? Um, so that was uh, that was kind of where I was as a student, was just discovering this, um, this apparently radical feminist um, hostility towards trans people, this kind of queer space that was very much kind of gay and lesbian and didn't explicitly include me. Uh, and having to do everything on my own. So, summer 2003, I graduate and I move to uh, Brighton on the south coast, much nearer where I grew up. And I have lots of my old friends from, from my previous school there, uh, the ones I came out to when I was 16, and they're still my closest friends. And um, I move in with, with one of those and I, I resume those friendships. And this starts to make me feel more comfortable. And I start going out around Brighton um, as Juliet. For the first time, I start telling people that this is the name I chose for myself when I was 10 years old and it had been in my head all the while. And I start kind of choosing the styles of clothes I want to wear. Now, one of the stereotypes about transsexual women is that uh, we often tend to dress like our kind of grandmothers or in this style of clothing that. Um, that isn't really appropriate for the age. And I'm spending a lot of time watching silent movies at this point, stuff from the kind of 1920s. And really, I want to dress like Louise Brooks in Pandora's Box or Nazimova in her version of Oscar Wilde's Salome. And um, this is neither affordable nor practical. Um, the costumes in the Nazimova film cost $350,000 in 1922. I even not accounting for inflation. I didn't really have that kind of money. Um, so I'm gradually uh, exploring my own kind of style and gender identity um, and how they relate to each other through my friends at the University of Sussex, where I'm doing my master's. Um, 
and just through socialising in what are starting to be called LGBT venues. And you can find lists on the internet by this point of venues that are trans friendly. And so I go with my friends to these venues. And I don't really want to do anything special. I actually just want to sit and have a chat, but I feel much more like myself. Um, if I feel I can express myself as the person I feel myself to be. So I start going to these clubs, but I also, uh, I'm doing a, a, a master's at the University of Sussex, and I start meeting people at this university, which has a reputation, it has a queer studies department and a gender studies department, which Manchester doesn't have. It's much more modern. And I start being introduced to all these writers like uh, Kate Bornstein, um, Ricky Ann Wilchins, Leslie Feinberg, and uh, the one who came to mean the most to me, which was Sandy Stone, I've already mentioned. Um, and in the late 80s, uh, Sandy Stone writes a response to the transsexual empire, uh, and it's called The Empire Strikes Back, a post-transsexual manifesto. And in this, um, Stone offers this kind of analysis of gender identity that had escaped both the feminist discussions on transsexualism, but also the medical ones. Um, and it opened up this kind of autonomous speaking position for trans people. It actually started off not with Janice Raymond, but with some of the more notable transsexual autobiographies. Um, people like Lily Elba, who was the world's first kind of um, fully transsexual woman. She actually died on the operating table after an attempt to transplant ovaries into her body. She died of transplant rejection. Uh, but also people like Hedy Joe Starr, who was a striptease artist, uh, Christine Jorgensen, and uh, Jan Morris, who was one of the most famous transsexual women in the UK. She was a travel writer, uh, quite well known before her transition, and she wrote an autobiography called Conundrum in the 70s, which had that kind of framing I talked about, you know, this kind of struggle to realise oneself as a woman, placed against a kind of successful career and happy middle-class life and this anxiety about how they would clash with each other and whether one would cost her the other. And this struggle to integrate the two and to protect everything. Um, so Sandy Stone attacks the language in a lot of these transsexual autobiographies. Uh, for example, she mentions a moment in Lily Elba's book where Lily Elba talks about waking up from one of her surgeries and having what she calls a woman's script. And Sandy Stone says, well, what do you mean? Like, why would your handwriting change? Because you had an operation. They didn't operate on your hands, right? Um, and she says, no wonder that the uh, feminist theories have been suspicious because I'm suspicious. And she said that a lot of these autobiographies didn't really account for that space between male and female. It just takes some time, uh, a process of years maybe, to physically move from one to the other and different things that you learn along the way about gender presentation. Um, Sandy Stone um, doesn't just talk about the autobiographies and the feminist attacks on trans people. She also talks about the way the medical establishment um, dealt with transsexual people. And I mentioned earlier that Raymond thought that transsexual women and the gender identity clinics were kind of in collaboration with each other and Sandy Stone says, no, any transsexual person will tell you this isn't the case. It's actually quite an antagonistic relationship. And uh, the feminine stereotypes that Raymond is talking about, these often come from the fact that the gender identity clinics force the transsexual women to dress in this very hyper-feminine way that you would never demand of somebody who'd been born female. Um, and you have to jump through these hoops in order to get the treatment. And for the transsexual people, it wasn't worth challenging this to jeopardize their own treatment. So the status quo kind of remained. She talks about a book called The Transsexual Phenomenon by the sexologist Harry Benjamin, published in the 60s. And after The Transsexual Phenomenon is published, there's an explosion of trans people getting through the gender identity clinic system. And the clinicians are really confused by this because they've set up their pathway to make it as difficult as possible for people to transition. But what they've basically done is issue a kind of guidebook. It tells you all the questions you need to answer and how to answer them. It was like when I did maths and just checked in the back of the book. Um, so, so there's this kind of contract between the clinics and the people using their services. And um, 
this idea of passing as male or female, which makes it really impossible to challenge that contract between the clinicians, but also to think more about this space between male and female. Uh, and the Sandy Stone Manifesto asks writers and artists and activists uh, and any other transsexual people to talk more about that space. And this opens up a lot more room. In the early 90s, you get all these writers like Kate Bornstein, who has transitioned from male to female, is very open about her history, very open about the fact she has a specific history as somebody who's transitioned. You get Leslie Feinberg, um, who tries to create a political movement based around this idea of transgender, of this umbrella term that takes in the old transvestite, cross-dresser, transsexual terms, but anybody else who wants to define themselves within it. And this is really the first time you get a movement of trans people trying to define their own language. The language has always been defined by the medical establishments and by the media, and to some extent by hostile feminist critics. So you start to develop their own language. And... Um, I discover this term transgender through my own reading. And at the time, I'm dating men in Brighton and uh, as a gay man. And I suddenly realize, partly through these relationships and partly through my other explorations, that I'm not a gay man. Uh, I end up in psychotherapy, uh, partly because of this gender identity issue and partly because I've just got a really horrible job. Um, and they pay for the psychotherapy, which, as far as I was concerned, was the least they could do. But... Um, uh, so I'm working for this big financial company. And um, so I start psychotherapy, and, and through that, um, I realized this is a much more fundamental issue to me than I'd kind of admitted to myself. And I start to identify as transgender. I kind of like having this space that it gives me, um, something I feel I can own. And so over the next kind of few years, I discover this kind of transgender culture that's come out of, uh, come out of these theories um, and people are living these theories in uh, kind of queer spaces. Uh, there's a festival called Trans Fabulous, and people like Kate Bornstein come and perform there. There's Cabaret with the Queer Belgrade Collective come over and do a really amazing show. Um, and I discover all these much more fun and exciting, but also... Um, inspiring ways of owning your own gender identity and doing something creative with it. And it's all a really far cry from the Daily Mail with their horrible stereotypes and the Jerry Springer show and all the other things that make me feel like I'm either a freak or an object of fetishization um, or some sort of sad sexist loser or any of the other stereotypes that are forced upon me. So through engaging with all of this kind of art and culture and theory and also the mainstream media, I start transitioning in 2009. I'm 27 years old. I go to my doctor and you have to go through your doctor, the process in the UK. We're very lucky to get hormones and sex reassignment surgery on the uh, National Health Service. This was a right that had been secured about 10 years earlier. And people, are, the conservatives, um, newspapers are often trying to argue against it, but it's, it's still a, a right that we have at the moment. And so I go to the doctor and say, oh, I want to uh, I want to start the process of gender reassignment. And he says, oh, yeah, you spoke about this before. And this was a real surprise to me because that strikes me as the kind of thing I would have remembered speaking about, right? But apparently not. So he refers me to a local psychiatrist in um, Hove. And I have to go through a number of questions just to determine that I'm not a kind of feminine gay man or I have some other mental health problem that makes me feel I want to transition. And he says, that's fine. So I will refer you to the national, one of the national gender identity clinics in London at Charing Cross, and you can go through that process. And I'd written about trans issues quite a lot already. I'd written a column for a local LGBT newspaper in Brighton and a magazine, uh, and I'd written short stories about gender and gender identity and people kind of living on the fringes of it or exploring it in different contexts. Uh, I'd also spent a lot of time writing for some very, very obscure film magazines, mainly one called Film Waves, which is gone now, um, and I'd written on literature, and I was looking for a kind of new project. And I phoned my friend Joe from university, who's a, a wonderful novelist, Joe Stretch, his name is, I'd really recommend you read him. And he's one of my closest friends, he's very much on my wavelength, we talk about writing all the time. 
and I tell him that I'm coming out as transsexual. And the first thing he does is look at me and say, goodbye, penis. And I just said, mm -hmm. there are other ways. And um, the second thing he says is, will you still support Norwich City, which is my favourite football team? <laughs> and I said, no, Joe, I'm going to support Ipswich Town, our local rivals. Of course I'm going to support Norwich. And then the next time we talk about it is um, I phone him up and he asks how it's all going. And I say very, very slowly. And I've come out at work. I've uh, sent, I'm have i about to send a letter to my parents. I've come out to all my friends. And so far it's going okay. Like we've handled things with work with some of the managers there. And I work for the health service at this point. People are quite open-minded. If anything, they're too open-minded. They want to know everything. And I'm just saying, look, I've talked about this so much. Can't we talk about politics or religion or <laughs> anything that's easier? Um, so we, you know, they, they respect that. And my friends are great. I mean, they, they've seen this persona kind of build and they've seen that it's actually, uh, is genuinely me over the last kind of five or six years. So nobody is completely shocked that I'm doing this. So, you know, there are some difficult discussions with friends, but it's generally okay. And so I, I phone Joe and I tell him how it's all going. And um, he says, look, you should pitch a blog to The Guardian. They'll bite your hand off. And I say, Joe, I don't know if you know about The Guardian's record on transgender issues. And Joe just says, no, of course I don't. Um, and I just said, well, it's, it's a long and complicated history and it's nowhere near as kind of open-minded or as uh, welcoming as you might expect. And actually, it's really influenced by these radical feminists, by Janice Raymond. And I said, look, you know, do you know anything about Janice Raymond and this brand of radical feminism? And Joe said, no, of course I don't. Just give me the gist of it. And I said, it's not very good, basically. Um, there were a few articles in the uh, early part of the 21st century um, which dealt with gender identity from this kind of, from a kind of mainstreamed version of this radical feminist um, trans exclusionary position that I've been talking about. Uh, this is by a writer called Julie Birchall. I don't know if any of you will know Julie Birchall. Um, She's kind of a joke in the UK. There was a point when she was relevant, but it was before I was born, but she's still around. Um, this is from, remember her name, she comes up again, but this is, uh, this is from 2001. Um, and she's talking about trans people as a group. Uh, she's arguing against the NHS funding gender reassignment. Um, and she says about transvestites, she says, the best reason for their continuing existence is that they demonstrate how very stupid men look, in fact, when they dress up as women. In the context of pantomime, this is perfectly appropriate. But for the rest of them, I see no difference between transvestite entertainers and the late black and white minstrels, um, who were a performance group who performed in blackface. Um, she says, they're both extremely offensive, and I don't understand why one is beyond the pale and the other is totally acceptable in enlightened circles. And yes, I know they're not the same, but may I say that I feel even less patience with transsexuals. Male to female transsexuals are Michael Jackson to the transvestite Ali G, who was a kind of comic act at the time. Not content to dress up temporarily as the other, they presume that its authenticity can be theirs through a few cosmetic adjustments. We laugh at people who want to change colour. We are shocked that millions of Japanese women each year have their eyes permanently occidentalized. We ban skin lightening preparations, and we would never dream of letting black people have Jackson-type whitening operations on the NHS. So that's her take on trans people. Um, but Judy Birchall is, like I said, is a bit of a joke by this point. Um, she kind of, she positions herself on the left, but she basically makes a career out of winding people up. Um, taken more, much more seriously is another um, feminist writer called Julie Bindle. And to be fair to Julie Bindle, she's done lots of good work around domestic violence and setting up shelters and things. But she's very much from this kind of 70s um, trans-exclusionary radical feminist position. Uh, this is an article, both of these articles, by the way, use the words gender bending or gender benders in their headlines, which is a very kind of transphobic uh, term in the UK. And this article starts off by, by Julie Bindle. It's from The Guardian in 2004. Um, 
and it starts off by talking about a woman in Canada who wanted to um, have access to a, a shelter for rape victims, male to female transsexual women. And again, there's, you know, you, you could argue there's a discussion to be had there. Uh, you know, I can understand some of the intersecting issues here. But Bindle goes on to a sort of um, a much more uh, general discussion of trans people. Um, and um, some of the sentences here say things like, the Equal Opportunities Commission, your best friend if you were a man wanting to get into nightclubs free on ladies' night, have a lot to learn. Last summer, it supported the case of five male to female transsexuals. Only one of them had disposed of his meat and two veg, which is slang for genitalia, on the grounds of sex discrimination after a pub landlord objected to one of them using the women's toilets. The claim was rejected with the judge stating that although he accepted the claimant's wish to regard themselves as women, a person's wish, quote, doesn't determine what he is. Quite, says Bindle. Call me old-fashioned, but I thought the one battle we feminists won fair and square was to convince those at least left of centre that gender roles are not made up. The gender roles are made up, she says. They are not real. We play at them. She carries on to say, I look back on those days with affection and, yes, nostalgia. At least those women were women and hadn't gone to gender reassignment clinics to have their breasts sliced off and a penis made out of their beer bellies. The attitude was, we're comfortable in our own skin. Let's be women but subvert what that means. Could we really have imagined back then that unpicking constructions of gender would result in quick fit sex changes on offer to all and sundry? And she goes on to... Uh, to say, um, also, those who transition seem to become stereotypical in their appearance. Fuck me shoes and bird's nest hair for the boys, beards, muscles and tattoos for the girls. Think about a world inhabited just by transsexuals. It would look like the set of Greece. Now, this article was published in 2004 and uh, people got quite angry about it, understandably. Um, there are a lot of angry letters to The Guardian. Um, about this from an increasingly organized trans community kind of online, uh, one of the things that the internet did was let trans people have this kind of mixture of um, anonymity and be able to share their experiences with like-minded people. Uh, it helped me a lot when I was 16, 17. I would look online to find trans people in my area and I just emailed them. So it takes out all the kind of issues around my appearance and how I feel about that when I'm communicating. And it helps me find a community. And this community is gradually growing and growing and growing. And uh, Julie Bindle uh, is by no means the only writer for The Guardian to publish articles like this. She's just the one who the article hits at the time when everyone is organized uh, and also when the internet is making this kind of writing permanent. You know, in the past, you published something, the next day it basically disappeared, that was that, and maybe there were five angry letters to the paper and the editor would choose one of them to publish. And now, of course, by 2009, this was no longer the case. Um, my friend Joe had immediately seen what I couldn't, that there was space for this kind of blogging about um, trans issues. And one of the things that online journalism has done is allow more space for kind of divergent voices, different people. And it makes it harder for editors to keep people out of those spaces in the way they had done when I was growing up in the 90s. And it's also quite cheap. Um, the Guardian asked me, uh, I, I got the, I pitched the series through a friend of mine who I knew through the football, and uh, he took me to the section editor who said, yes, we, you know, they read some of my other writing and they said, yes, we'd like to have you write for us. Can you write three pieces up front? Um, they would have given me a kill fee if they'd not liked them. And if they liked the three pieces, they said, we'll run the whole series. So I sent them three. I sent them the first one, which dealt with the moment where I realized that I cross-dressed through to the age of kind of 22 when I realized that I wasn't a gay man. They liked that one. The second one dealt with my mid-twenties with discovering this transgender identity and discovering a kind of radical queer politics um, and radical queer arts. They didn't like that one as much. The third one dealt with my first week living as a woman and they liked that one. And the editor wrote back and said, can you rewrite the second one so you take out a lot of the explicit politics and theory and make it more personal? 
And I was really affronted by this. I was like, no, I'm a serious theorist. I'm not, you know, some fluffy confessional writer like Liz Jones or, or somebody in the Daily Mail. You know, that's not what I do. And I grudgingly thought, well, let's try this. And actually, it really made the thing work, uh, making the, the kind of radical politics into the kind of subtext, but giving a kind of personal story to let the reader in, uh, suck people in a lot more. Uh, and this was the compromise I had to make. Uh, lots of my friends who I'd met through queer circles by this point had tried to write about trans issues for the mainstream media and said they'd always heard the same thing. They were told that, oh, the public don't understand the issues. They're too complicated. And, you know, it's, it's too much of a minority. We don't need to cover it. And then there were all these stereotypes from the kind of radical feminists, as they called themselves, uh, the trans exclusionary radical feminists, and also conservatives in the Daily Mail, that hasn't changed a bit. You know, there's like a writer called Richard Littlejohn, who's the worst of them, who frequently writes about trans people and portrays trans women as, you know, these kind of stubbly, burly men in floral dresses wanting something for free from the from the state. And I thought that writing uh, a column about my own experiences might be the best way to try and uh, attack all of these points Simultaneously, um, it struck me that all of these critiques, all of these attacks relied on stereotyping of trans people and that by presenting an extended um, trans subjectivity in that kind of mainstream space would attack all of those points at the same time. But I also thought about someone like my 10-year-old self in a small town like Hawley and I thought, well, actually, I had nothing then. And there are things now that exist, but there's no obvious central point. There's nothing nothing to start somebody off. And for friends and family who might not know where to start looking into these issues, to have the questions they want to ask about trans issues answered in a way that's not offensive or confrontational, perhaps we could do this. So we run the first of the blogs. It takes The Guardian nearly a year to publish the first one, but in June 2010 it runs. And a day before they're going to run the column, my editor writes to me and says, do you want the comments to be enabled? And I thought, oh, God. <laughs> and I turned around to the woman next to me in my day job and I said, Anita, the Guardian had just written to me. They want to know if I should have comments on my blog or not. And Anita said, why are you asking me? I'm commissioning maternity services. And I realized I'd have to work this out myself. And I kind of thought, oh, God, what's the worst that can happen? I'd had about a year of walking around the streets of Brighton and other towns and having people yell abuse at me because of the way I presented, uh, you know, sometimes throwing things, threats of violence, uh, whatever. And I thought, I don't care, right? If somebody on the internet with a stupid avatar and a stupid name says something nasty to me before the moderators turn it off, whatever, I've had much worse walking around my streets. So I said yes. And we... Um, we ran the first of the columns, and the first comment says, this is really great. You know, the Guardian has needed to improve its record on trans stuff for some time. The second comment says, God, is it this easy to get a blog at the Guardian now? Is it all I have to do is to put on a skirt and I get a series at the Guardian? And I read that and I thought, thank you, thank you, thank you. In a second, you've justified this project. And sure enough, there's then loads of comments are saying this is exactly why this column needs to exist. I'm really glad this is here. I want to read more of it. So over the coming weeks, it runs once a fortnight and uh, I write about all sorts of subjects. Um, I start off with the, the three pieces I've mentioned and then I write about coming out to my family, how I hand wrote them a three page letter explaining that I was transitioning and then that, that would um, maybe explain why my life hadn't taken the path they thought it might and how we met up and we had a very long and difficult discussion about my gender but ultimately my parents came to kind of accept it and understand that I would still be the same person. Uh, we talked about the process of um, passing in the streets as a woman and how I felt about this and how it related to the theory I'd read that said we should move beyond passing, but how I'd found that when I was walking around the streets and I didn't pass, there were all sorts of threats um, and questions and everything that meant to regulate my gender. And so I had to find this difficult path between how I wanted to be and how the world would let me be, I guess. 
So I wrote about that. And actually, I found that that was the article that attracted the most comments. It was quite interesting to find that I thought it would be the articles about transitioning at work or telling my family or things like that that would attract the most discussion. And actually, it wasn't. It was the very specific trans experiences, the experience of this passing uh, and the experience of being asked very intrusive questions about my gender. Those were the ones that made people the most angry, actually, funnily enough. And what the comment section also did was kind of tease out the uh, fault lines um, where support and hostility for me came from. And actually, they cut across party politics and they cut across LGBT politics. I would have um, people who made it clear they were lesbian women who would be supportive, others who would attack me from the kind of perspectives I've talked about. I would have gay men be supportive. I would have gay men be negative, straight men, straight women conservatives be supportive or hostile people on the left being supportive or hostile so it was really interesting to find that because i'd always found that transphobia had cut across the right and left and so there'd been no place for me but actually the hostility did but also the support uh but i've kind of devoted myself to trying to make britain's liberal left media more friendly towards trans people. Um, so I went from writing for The Guardian to also writing for The New Statesman, which is similar position to The Guardian. It's Labour, so it's kind of neoliberal left. Um, you know, these, these are not radical publications. They may have been, you know, in the 30s, but they're, they're not now. Uh, I also wrote for Time Out, the um, London kind of listings magazine. And gradually did what I felt I could try to do to open up more space for trans people in the mainstream media. Uh, one of the interesting things that happened with the column was that my editor, a woman called Rachel, said that she wanted to um, commission other trans writers once a month to go with my pieces. Um, and that was another place where I had to accept a kind of compromise and couldn't do everything I wanted to do. We got pieces in by uh, a trans woman called Ros Caveney, who'd written for The Guardian before, um, a trans man called Stephen Whittle, who was a long-standing activist with a group called Press for Change, and uh, a trans comedian, uh, a woman called Beth Black. Um, I also got commissioned something by my favourite theorist, a woman called Julia Serrano, um, a kind of genderqueer, African-American performer called Ignacio Rivera, and a trans man who was also a stand-up comedian called Jason Barker, and I wanted him to write about um, the process of having a child after beginning to live as a man. And uh, none of those pieces appeared in the end, which is a real shame. The, uh, the latter uh, particularly um, depressed me later on because a couple of years later, there was a big media... Um, frenzy about a trans man who'd got pregnant uh, and there was a lot of uh, investigation by kind of the nastiest tabloid press to try and find out who this person was and I remember when that happened I kind of wondered maybe if we'd been able to publish Jason's piece and been able to show that this wasn't a completely unique story actually and that there didn't need to be this kind of uh, circus around it from the press then um, then things might have turned out differently now, this series ran from 2010 to the end of 2012, on and off. I didn't write every fortnight. I took a break and I came back because the process of transition was so slow. But there are a number of other um, interesting media stories in the UK about trans people. Um, one of them was a lawyer who was known professionally as David Burgess and everywhere else as Sonia. And uh, in 2010, she was... Um, pushed under a tube train at King's Cross Station and, and killed. And this became a very big story. Um, it was initially reported using words like man in a dress is killed at King's Cross. Uh, and gradually it became clear that she had this kind of trans identity. And then a lot of the tabloid newspapers uh, rooted through transgender contact sites and websites like the ones I use. I think I may have met Sonia on a website at some point, actually. I'm not entirely sure of that, but I think we spoke... Um, and the coverage was just horrific. It was really, really awful. And I actually got a call from The Guardian around about the time this happened saying, Juliet, this story has come up. Can you look at one of the pieces we've written uh, and help us handle it? Because we're really struggling with the pronouns because this person lived 
mostly as a woman and clearly that was where she wanted to be, but still professionally was working as male. So I looked at the piece and just took all the pronouns out actually and kind of rewrote the sentences, avoiding the words he and she and just using her surname um, and sent it back to them. I also put them in touch with a group called Transmedia Watch who'd sprung up in I think 2009 uh, as an online campaign to deal with kind of negative print and broadcast uh, portrayals of trans people and to offer kind of constructive advice so rather than just to kind of shout at people and say you're doing this wrong they created a kind of style guide uh, they did a lot of very good work they created a kind of memorandum of understanding which they shared with various publications and broadcasters um, so this was all happening in kind of 2010-11 um, there's a lot more I could say I don't know how long have we been um, what time are we on Okay, uh, well, I'll start wrapping up. Um, so into 2012, um, I'd covered all the social sides of the transition, um, which was my original aim. I wanted to show that social space of transition, the process of changing name, starting on hormone treatment, uh, navigating the streets and work and family and everything else. And I didn't really want to write about the surgery. And I didn't want to do this because so much writing about transition and trans issues have been this very individualistic writing about people's surgeries. And it, you know, to quote one trans activist I spoke to, that tended to suck the energy out of the room. But I thought maybe it would be nice if I could find a different way of doing this. Um, and I spoke to plenty of people, trans, not trans, other writers, other journalists, and in the end, we concluded this was the right thing for me to do. So I tried to put it uh, in a very kind of psychological framing, uh, you know, very interested in psychotherapy and psychoanalysis, but also to be very pragmatic about it and just say, well, look, this is what happened when I went to the hospital. This is what I had to take. This is what they gave me. And to try and put the readers in my position. So presenting the paperwork that I was given that would explain what happened in the surgery and just quoting that for the readers to read to try and place them with me, hoping that they would follow me on this because they'd followed me all the way through the blocks. Um, on the whole, I was pleased with how this went. And when we got to the point of writing about the surgery, the pieces had usually been about 900 words, which, you know, when you're covering a subject that's had very little mainstream media coverage, it's very hard to do anything in 900 words. But because I had this rolling blog with as much space as I wanted to, I've been able to introduce a lot of the kind of political and social issues that I wanted to bring in. But I said to them, look, with the surgery, do you mind if I take longer and I, I write more? And they said, yeah, look, write as much as you need and we'll edit if we have to. And, uh, you know, by this point, I built up this really important bond of trust with my editor which was wonderful because she let me write 3,000 words on my week in hospital, which included quoting a lot of a poem by Jacques Prévert that somebody read to me. They'd let me do almost anything by this point. Um, so we published the piece and, you know, on the whole, I, I think it was, it was very successful. I was very, very happy with it. It got a good reception. People seemed to like it. Um, and then I wrapped up the series at the end of 2012 with some conclusions, um, about the process of transition, but also about the process of writing. Um, I think I concluded by saying that I think the thing I've learned from this is that there are as many gender identities as there are people. And then the final lines of the, uh, the series just says, but who's going to commission all those blogs and who's going to read them? Because uh, that's a lot of blogs, right? Um, so so I think it had been a really interesting exercise in kind of um, personal writing, in life writing, political writing, uh, but also kind of collaborative writing. You know, I kind of tried to take on as much feedback as I could from my readers. And that dialogue with them in the comment section was really great. And, you know, there's an awful lot to dislike about comment sections on media websites. Um, but this actually, you know, this was really kind of heartwarming. Um, and all the hostile comments actually met with this kind of really interesting kind of organized and intelligent resistance. Um, and the trans people tended to win most of the arguments. And I think that came about from the fact that we were setting more favorable terms. 
And by this point, through the work of Transmedia Watch and through the work of lots of other independent writers and activists, you're starting to see more trans people slowly breaking into the mainstream media. And uh, this was important um, in January 2013, um, when... You know, we, we generally kind of felt that The Guardian, The Observer, its sister publication on Sundays, were getting a lot better at covering um, trans people and trans issues, were more sympathetic, were letting trans people write about themselves more. And uh, then um, a big row erupted on Twitter. Um, the details of it are very, very boring. Um, but it ended up in a standoff between Suzanne Moore, who um, is a feminist uh, columnist, for the Guardian, somebody I'd met several times and liked, and I publicly defended several times, um, and somebody who's a lot more nuanced on trans issues than Julie Birch or, or Julie Bindle. Uh, you know, she'd written about Kate Bornstein quite positively in the nineties. Um, her take on this, you know, was by no means perfect, but was was a lot more interesting. And I, you know, I have discussed these issues with Suzanne since, and you know, I'm willing to talk to her about it. Uh, but she's good friends with Julie Birchall. And so after about a week of this argument between Suzanne and a group of trans people online, um, Suzanne wrote a piece about female anger and she talked about people wanting the bodies of a Brazilian transsexual. And quite a lot of people pointed out to Suzanne, not unreasonably, that although um, there was Leia T, a trans model in Brazil, uh, even she'd been disowned by her father, the famous football player, Tolinho Cerezo. Uh, but also the murder rate of trans women in Brazil is just through the roof. And, you know, lots of people pointed that out very impolitely because it's the internet and that's what happens. Uh, but lots of people actually tried to engage with her on this as well. And, um, you know, her response to it was not as graceful as it might have been. Um, and this got worse and worse and worse. And in the end, The Observer decided to commission a response from Julie Birchall. Um, now, the um, response, basically, um, I didn't actually bring the, um, the Birchall article because it got depublished quite quickly. Um, but basically, it opened up by saying that actually uh, I and Suzanne Moore are still kind of working class people. There's this weird class aspect to it. And these kind of uh, trannies and she males and everything else that she called trans people are this bunch of kind of middle class academics who want to destroy feminism. Um, and uh, it was a really, really unpleasant piece, uh, staggeringly vitriolic. Um, and actually, it ended up doing far more harm than good to Julie Birchall's cause because before everything with people like Julie Bindle uh, and even Jermaine Greer. Um, some of the people I've mentioned, this stuff all looked quite difficult to understand, quite boring, and this weird kind of fringe of LGBT and feminist politics I didn't really understand. By publishing something just so outright aggressive and nasty and hateful um, in a prominent space in The Guardian, and um, The Observer, but on The Guardian website, um, actually it gave a good view to a much wider audience of just exactly what trans people have had to face from the mainstream media for the last kind of 50 or 60 years. Uh, so there were huge um, protests against this piece. It closed with about 3,000 comments, which are pretty much uniformly, utterly negative. Um, and after a day, uh, Julie Birchall's piece was taken off the Observer and Guardian website. They published an editorial saying, look, we can't actually defend this piece in its published form, uh, so we're going to delete it. And Julie Birchall's friends started protesting about freedom of speech, as if the right to say something and the right to have it published in a national newspaper were exactly the same thing. And it turned out that Julie Birchall was so oppressed and censored that it was immediately republished by the Daily Telegraph. So you can get the same piece published by the same uh, by two national newspapers in a day. But there's quite an interesting symbolic move because The Guardian is ostensibly the most left-wing of the broadsheet newspapers and The Daily Telegraph is the most conservative. So you saw um, the kind of protests against this kind of ostensibly left-wing transphobia actually being uh, opposed by people on the left now and liberals. 
uh, and being pushed over to the right and being seen more as a kind of conservative ideology. And certainly, you know, Julie Birchall's position on trans people, the Julie Bindle article I've mentioned, which she did partially apologise for, um, and Janice Raymond, their position on trans people and the conservative position on trans people, um, I think is actually almost identical. Um, and it's taken an awful lot of writing from all sorts of artists, writers and activists to show that. Uh, but the response to the virtual thing was quite encouraging. Um, they commissioned a number of responses from trans people, as well as a wider history of the trans rights movement, which I'd never seen in a mainstream newspaper before. So I think what we we're starting to see was something that I'd hoped would happen, which was a move from this kind of individualistic trans politics, which is partially imposed by editors and publications this idea that no we want to hear about your personal stories and if you do the personal stories and you do them well enough to awaken interest in the wider issues that frame them then maybe just maybe you can break more community concerns into a mainstream space where you can gain more support and understanding for them so um yeah i'm going to close on a sort of cautiously optimistic note uh, these sort of struggles, you know, they're never just upward progress. There are always some victories and some defeats and some setbacks. Uh, and the virtual piece felt like a setback, but it was also a really important moment. And uh, we won. Uh, so, yeah, I'm going to close there. Thank you. Thank you for listening.